Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come speak to this great gathering today uh, on the many faces of gentrification. Um, I work for a regional council of government called the Piedmont Triad Regional Council. We are a 12-county agency. Um, here's our map. You'll see us in the, in the center of the state there. Um, we represent about uh, 1.7 million people in those 12 counties and 74 member governments. Um, and if you look at the other two regions that are shown up there, called the Piedmont Crescent with Centralina, Charlotte region, as well as the Triangle area, um, that represents about two-thirds of the population of the state. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data from our other three large cities in the Piedmont Triad, and then also speak a little bit about um, issues across our 12-county region. Um, so I work in our planning department, so we work on behalf of our local governments on, on various issues related to uh, subjects like, like today's conference. Um, so just a little bit about some of the previous work that we've done. Um, we've been around for 50 years, and uh, about five years ago, we, we partnered up with uh, Piedmont Authority for Regional Transportation, Winston-Salem State University, UNC Greensboro, NCAT, um, on a uh, regional planning effort with a Sustainable Communities Grant. And what you see up there at Piedmont Together is the result of that effort. I've got some copies of that, uh, that plan if anybody's interested. It's about five years old now, so it's probably uh, worth updating uh, as, 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 as uh, you know, there's a lot of that has changed in those last five years. But I just wanted to point on, a, a touch on a few key uh, elements of that plan. We've uh, performed our first equity uh, study for uh, a region of our size across the country. Um, of course, that sustainability theme, uh, collaborating with multiple partners. We also recognize there's, there's several challenges there. I'm curious if anybody could add to that list. You know, we've got, uh, we're made up of mill towns in our rural areas. Um, you know, we have mobility challenges that, that influence, uh, you know, our transportation costs, uh, in addition to what we're talking about today with our housing costs. Um, changing economy, changing ways that we uh, uh, employ ourselves and how companies operate. Uh, health, energy. Who, who's got a couple other thoughts to add to that list? Oh, okay. Um, well, but I think the point here uh, and what I want to touch on is just looking at a little bit of data from the region and I don't want to steal any thunder from our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Sills, who worked uh, on, on uh, one of the uh, key tenets of this plan, which was a fair housing assessment for the region. Um, one of the things we uh, put together is uh, an environmental justice scan. We updated that in 2016, um, looking at nine different indicators uh, by census track. Uh, it was available online if you want to take a look at that in terms of what are, uh, where are you above the, maybe the county average for older adults, race, uh, poverty status, unemployment, education, English as a second language, disability, vehicle, vehicles in the household, and uh, heads of female. Uh, females at, as head of household. Um, so just, I want to touch on a little bit of what we, what we, just to give you a flavor of what that regional plan is that we worked on five years ago, called Piedmont Together. So we looked at um, various census tracts in the region, uh, so we, we compiled a lot of data. I'm just going to give you a flavor of that. Right here we've got homes built before 1980, and as we know, 477, that can be a, uh, a lead hazard with homes of that. Nature. And I will say in our, our rural areas of the region, a lot of the issues are uh, quality uh, affordable housing. So there's, it's not necessarily price, but it's availability of quality affordable housing that you would want to raise a child and raise a family in is, is getting harder and harder to find. Um, so we looked at um, other factors and overlaid those on top of those homes built before 1980. If there's a high concentration of minority population, people living in poverty, households with no vehicle access. And in the bright green, those are also areas where we worked with our uh, partners in, in collaboration to identify uh, targeted areas where uh, maybe the, the city or county are investing uh, resources in some redevelopment or in, in an infrastructure project, that sort of thing. And this is all available online at Piedmont Together. So jumping into kind of today's presentation, we wanted to take a look what's changed since uh, over the last, oh, six years or so. And so we, what we've done is take the three, 387 census tracts. I know you guys have had a lot of data this morning. We're just going to keep going through lots of data. Um, but I think one interesting thing to point out here for my laser pointer, 
uh, works. If we look at those 387 uh, census tracts in some of our rural areas, um, you're actually losing uh, home value in some, some locations. Now on our higher end, a big jump in, in home values uh, for, for uh, a sample of those 387 census tracts. Um, and I think another thing to point out here too is if you look at the population change between 2010 and 2016, you know, if you look at uh, the, the white population, very flat. So you've got most, of, most or all of that growth between 2010 and 2016 is in, in minority population. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, data from our, our three other large cities in the triad, including Winston-Salem, where we have overlaid uh, the change in uh, home value and then the change in minority population in those census tracts. And this is just a scatter plot. I'll skip over that for now. I, I, I was in a session earlier with a lot of scatter plots. Um, so here, what you can see, just let me explain this briefly. The, the hotter red areas are your biggest increase in home value by census tract. Just remember, we're only looking at one data point. There's lots of other uh, data points to look at, right? So you've got you considering rent. So this is just looking at home values. Uh, and these do not overlay nicely over neighborhoods, so don't think of them as, you know, sections of neighborhoods as this census tract data. I, I realize the numbers are, are hard to see there, but you can see, um, you know, how that, how that minority population is changing in the raw numbers uh, as a percentage, excuse me, not a raw number, but as a percentage uh, over those six years. So if you see a very large percentage, um, consider that there may be a, uh, a small minority population there in 2010, but that it's increased significantly over those few years. So on the left, we've got Winston-Salem. On the right, we've got, got High Point. Um, so you can see where those, those uh, uh, populations are changing along with home values. Uh, we also took a look at Greensboro and Burlington, kind of going east a little bit. Um, so uh, looking, uh, I don't have the downtowns outlined there, um, but one, one striking thing about Greensboro, in the downtown area, you've got a jump of, uh, of about 50% in, in one of the census tracts that touches on downtown uh, in minority population, um, and also uh, a modest increase in, in home values. Um, Burlington, going further east into Alamance County, the smallest of our, our four large cities, um, similar, similar data analysis there. And this will all be available to, to look at in more detail after, after today's session. Um, so what, what should we consider with this if you're looking at this? And I've got an online map viewer that uh, uh, our staff, Lawrence Holdsworth, had created where you can dive into that in a little more detail. But this is limited, right? So uh, we got a lo we're looking at a very large statistical area, a high margin of error. So just consider that. And then we didn't split out the, uh, the minority populations. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things to, to think about there is adding in more data, right? This is only kind of one slice of data, so we've got to look at some, some more information. Um, rents, I think, are very important. The cost burden, um, you know, it ranges in terms of a percentage of household income. If you're looking at Surrey County, Yadkin County, like Mount Airy or, or Jonesville, Elkin, you're up on if transportation is about uh, close to uh, 40%. Of, of household income, whereas in Forsyth County, it's closer to 30%. So it's a bigger chunk of, for transportation costs out in those rural areas. Um, and so, that, so that's another thing to think about with this data is what is that additional cost burden? Um, so this is kind of a start, maybe an area where to do more investigation in those, those hotspot areas. And what I've shown here on the right is uh, uh, the assessment for fair housing, which is a four or five years old now. That's something that we're looking at updating. And then the other map over there is that uh, index of census tracts, I understand it's very hard to see from back there, uh, for those nine environmental factors. So if you're seeing a, a red or a, a dark green, that's where seven to nine of those index, uh, indexes are above the county average. So that's another area to look at in terms of environmental justice. So that's a real quick overview of the triad. Hope I didn't overwhelm you with the data, but uh, if you have any questions or want more information after lunch, happy to talk with you. You can also talk with Lawrence Holdsworth over here. We've put together a lot of the data for us today. And then there's our online map viewer that uh, we can also make available for viewing. Okay, thank you.
Good afternoon. All right, so I have the uh, privilege of uh, introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Stephen Seals. So uh, Dr. Seals' academic research has focused largely on housing, health, and labor, especially pertaining to minorities, immigrants, and low-income communities. He has more than 40 publications in domestic and international journals, books, and in applied research reports. His current research and teaching centers on housing issues, neighborhood level uh, determinants of health outcomes, program evaluation, innovative research, met methodologies, and uh, stratification. Dr. Seals is adept at asset-based community development projects and has conducted numerous community-based participatory, participatory research projects with community partners. He has a strong method training and expertise, including multi-model survey design, evaluation, advanced statistical techniques, geographic information systems, focus groups, facilitation, visual observational studies, content analysis, and in-depth ethnographic work in immigrant communities. Wow. <laughs> All right, Dr. Seals has served as a methodological consultant evaluator on more than 70 grant-funded projects, among them diabetes prevention in the ARAB American community, uh, geo uh, spatial pediatric asthma surveillance and prevention in the African American community, and reducing the risk of diabetes and hypertension in the Montenard Dega community. Lastly, in Phoenix, Detroit, and mostly recently in rural counties of North Carolina, Dr. Seals has worked with youth drug prevention and recovery, youth homelessness, delinquency, and program evaluation for health, education, interventions targeting middle school students. In the 1990s, prior to his career in academia, Dr. Seals was a middle school and high school teacher in North Carolina, Washington, and abroad. So if you would, join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Seals. Thank you very much. I'm not going to stand up at the podium, but I'm going to walk around just a little bit so that uh, we can be a little bit more participatory. Um, too often, I'm talking at a person and not with a person. And this is that kind of topic where you really need to be talking with people, not at people. Um, gentrification, I'm gonna do something that, if I can get it to advance to the next slide. Maybe not. Philip, I'm gonna get you to advance these for me. Right over there. I'm going to do something that I tell my students not to do. I'm going to define the word. You know when uh, you were in elementary school or middle school and you started the paper according to Webster's? <laughs> yeah. I, I tell my students, please don't do that. That's just bad writing. But I'm going to do that today because we really need to be on the same page with what is gentrification. We need to define this term so that we can talk about this term, redefine this term, and think of new ways to shape uh, this uh, issue. Are we going to the next one? There it is, good. So gentrification, the process of renovating and improving, those are good words, renovating and improving, a house or district so that it conforms to middle class tastes. Huh. That, that, that's a morally loaded statement, okay? And they give a, a good example here. An area undergoing rapid gentrification. Many areas within Winston-Salem going through rapid gentrification, uh, conforming to middle-class tastes. Uh, it also has a, another connotation here about people. The process of making a person or an activity more refined or polite. By whose standards? By whose culture? 
So, so we can gentrify a person, we can gentrify a place, and that's problematic to start with, okay? There's some good things in here, renovating and improving, but when we're starting to lay moral messages on top of that renovating and improving, then we've got a problem. Next slide, please. When did this term start being used? So here's a, a Google timeline of the usage of the word gentrification in all of Google Books. You know, Google's out there scanning all the books in the world, right? And so it really hits in the 1950s. You start to see it in the United States and more in the UK in the 1950s. By about 1964, it's being picked up in the US in books. And then it suddenly skyrockets, 1968. What's going on in 1968? Civil rights, right. The Fair Housing Act of 1968, which redefined urban planning. It reshaped by policy who could live where. And so we started talking about gentrification, changing neighborhoods, renovating neighborhoods for middle class tastes. Okay? So this isn't a new problem, it's something that's come back over and over in waves in different parts of the country as we've uh, changed the policies regarding racial segregation and where people can live. Next slide, please. So this is a problematic concept. Gentrification is not redevelopment and renovation for the people living in the communities. It's replacement and displacement so that it can be renovated and improved for new people moving into the communities. And that's an issue that really has to be thought through as we discuss uh, improving quality of lives for the residents of everyone, all residents within a city. Next slide, please. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about mostly white, middle class, coming into mostly communities of color and displacing historic neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that have been around for 150, 200, 300 years in some cases. Long-standing communities that have a culture, a history, uh, markers of uh, the time that has been invested in those places. Sometimes these places are completely erased in the process. It might have the name on some plaque somewhere, but it's been erased from the history, the landscape, the geography. And so we need to keep that in mind as we talk about redevelopment without erasing the cultural heritage of a community. Southside Greensboro. In the 1990s, uh, this was a neighborhood on the southeast side of town, if anybody knows Greensboro, south of the train tracks, east of Elm Street. This was in the top left corner of what was allowed to be colored in the 1920s and 30s. It had been disinvested in for nearly a century. It was a blighted community. I'm, I'm going to use the quotes. This is, this is how we talk about um, urban planning, a, a neighborhood of blight um, that needed some kind of intervention, okay? Interventions are from outside, not from inside, right? So it was inter intervened upon. It's a beautiful area. There's a, a nice water fountain. There's some uh, uh, New Orleans-style um, urban landscape. Uh, it, it's won all kinds of awards for its architecture and its improvement, but the community that lived there at one time can't afford to live there today. The community has been replaced, okay? So in thinking about neighborhoods like this, South Side with its beautiful 1800s architecture replicated with 1990s and 2000s uh, construction, um, we have to think about how can we do that? How can we improve the property, improve the quality of life, but for the people living there, not replacing the people that are living there? Next slide, please. So really what I'm going back to is a history of disinvestment. 
we've had communities of color that were multi-generational households, homeowners, high home ownership rates, uh, people who have successful businesses living next door to professors, living next door to physicians, veterinarians, and working class folk, all in the same community. Successful inter-income, uh, multi-use neighborhoods until we began to disinvest in that in the 1930s. This, uh, this map, what is it commonly called? Redlining map, you've, you've seen these before. Okay, so this is 1937 for Winston-Salem. Those areas of red, class four areas, D, fourth, fourth grade, are areas where banks were not supposed to lend. They were also the neighborhoods of color. Let's go to the next slide. I've laid that map over a, a current map of Winston-Salem. Next slide. And I've circled a few areas on that map. The red areas are those disinvestment areas. Next map. And then I started adding some layers behind that. The uh, darker red colors are areas of high percentage African-American, above 50% or above 90% African-American. The green areas are Hispanic. Uh, the purple areas are Asian, and so on. Really, the two that we're going to be talking about are gray areas, white, reddish areas, African American, and green areas, Hispanic. And this is 2016 data. Next map. So you can see there in the southeast corner of Winston-Salem, a Hispanic community. And of course, this wouldn't have been there in 1930s but it was a community of color in the 1930s. It's just changed colors today, okay? Um, this is a kind of gentrification, but not like that middle class gentrification that we're talking about. It's a replacement of a community with another community of color in this case. And then we have in the North areas where there was disinvestment in the 1930s, they've remained largely, 90%, African American. Next one. This is median home values, and we see that those areas continue to have the lowest median home values over time. Whether we're talking about during recession, whether we're talking about uh, in booming years, the property values in these areas have remained lower compared to other neighborhoods. Next slide. So there's a number of mechanisms that are going into keeping these neighborhoods um, less economically successful than other no neighborhoods. And it leads to what we're today talking about, gentrification. If you have an economically um, uh, tenuous neighborhood, a neighborhood that is at risk because it's impoverished, has low home ownership rates, has uh, recently experienced devaluation through tax reforms and tax strategies that say this property is not worth as much as it was before, loss of wealth. Um, it has uh, areas where there's high percentages of vacant properties, vacant lots, homes that may have been um, heired to uh, someone, uh, uh, gifted to someone after the death of the, the owner, uh, and those heirs don't have the the means to maintain the property, um, demolitions. Uh, uh, we, we see code enforcement being used here um, as, a, as a proactive tool for, for uh, uh, displacement. We, we have all of these issues combining in these same neighborhoods that 100 years ago were the neighborhoods of disinvestment by policy. While in between we have 1968 Fair Housing Act and 1980s amendments to that act and 1990s amendments to that act, we have a failure of fair housing policy to create uh, more integrated communities, more um, uh, multi-class communities, communities that once were in these historic neighborhoods uh, have, have not been uh, the a result of the dream of the 1968 um, Act. At the same time, we also have uh, issues of public housing, 
highways. We heard Dr. Rosa, I believe, mention uh, Highway 52, cutting straight through African-American uh, neighborhood on the east side of town. Uh, we've had um, many ways in which uh, policy has divided the community even further and resulted in more uh, economic decline. Next slide. So our questions really today are, how do we encourage a process, that good part of gentrification, renovating and improving, but for current residents, without displacement, without replacement? How do we get more money into these communities to be spent on quality, safe, healthy homes, and not on replacing the community that's there and existing? How do we create a participatory process? Not one that's the developer saying, here's an opportunity area, an opportunity because of economic disinvestment and all of these mechanisms, but how do we get the community to participate in the planning? I think uh, um, Philip mentioned uh, during his session, how do we get the, the city not to listen, not to just listen to or pay lip service to? How do we get the planning agencies to not, not just do a charrette and, and, and go home, but how do we actually get the neighborhood to invest in planning its own future? We want this to be the infill uh, um, building. We want a park here. We want this kind of road with this kind of sidewalk. How do we get that as part of our renovating and improving process. It needs to be built in to any funding that's being pushed out for redevelopment purposes. Finally, how does a city redevelop an underdeveloped neighborhood due to this history of in, uh, disinvestment without producing future gentrification? And that's the balance, that's the hard part. How do we recognize the history, the individuals already living there, but also help in thinking about what do we want this community to look like in the future? How do we create an integrated, multiple income, uh, multiple use neighborhood without devaluing the history, recognizing the wrongs, and moving forward to a shared vision of a future? That's the hard part, the real hard part. Next slide, please. So I wanna rewrite this word. I think, I think gentrification needs a new definition, okay? So I, I did a little bit of editing here. I said, the process of renovating and improving a house or district so that it makes life better for the residents. That, that would be a good thing, okay? Quality of life. The process of listening to a person who has not had a voice. Instead of changing the person, listening to that person and including them in the process of redevelopment. <clears throat> Next one. So all the maps that I've made here, I have them for Greensboro as well. Tinyurl.com, Redline, WS, GSO, Winston-Salem, Greensboro. Tinyurl.com, Redline, WS, GSO. You can look at it on a mobile phone. You can click on and off. Uh, all of the layers and tiles. There's additional maps that are in there. Uh, it's very interactive and for both cities. Um, so I wanna leave you with that. It's a tool that you can use to look at your neighborhood and get some data on what's going on, you, on, on the ground. Use that data and all the other data sources that you're getting today to encourage voice in your neighborhoods in redefining what gentrification is. Thank you. So questions and answers. I'll try to have answers. Yes. Um, my question is uh, with you know, ways to uh, like with the gentrification. Um, I'm, on, I'm on the lending side. Uh, you know, doing a lot of affordable lending, uh, low to moderate income clients, and one of the ways that I think we can slow it down is ownership. 
um, in these areas that are currently being gentrified. Um, so what are your thoughts? Like for instance, East Winston here, I think is next on the table. Uh, so I think the only way you have a voice is to be at the table. And I think that's one of the things that we are not at the table when these things are coming about. And one of the ways to be at the table to me is ownership. So in your opinion, your research and data, are there other ways that we can be at the table without being an owner? Because a lot of these people are just renting yep. in these areas, so it's very easy to kick them out. Yep. So multiple elements there. First, let, let's talk about uh, home ownership. Middle class white families have 12 times the wealth of middle class black families. Same income. What's the difference? I own my home. I build that equity over time. I've got something to borrow against when, when I need to. Um, I've built lifelong wealth. And I didn't just build lifelong wealth. I built it in neighborhoods that continued to go up in value faster than neighborhoods uh, of color. So that's an issue. Home ownership is necessary. What's the number one reason, and, and uh, we referenced the Piedmont Together uh, report, I did an analysis of HMDA data, uh, Housing Mortgage uh, Disclosure Act data. Um, we know that the number one reason for an African American to be denied a loan is credit, bad credit. Well, we can fix that. We've got credit repair programs. City of High Points uh, doing a credit uh, repair program. Sophia Crisp is, is out in uh, neighborhoods recruiting members of the community in distressed neighborhoods to repair your credit, teach you about home ownership, and get you uh, a low interest loan, and even maybe some uh, uh, upfront uh, down payment assistance. We need more programs like that. We need them targeted to specific geographies of low home ownership, and we need to target people inside those neighborhoods to become homeowners of their own neighborhoods. Perfect point. Homeowners start thinking long term because they're investing their equity, they're investing their retirement accounts in a, a property, hoping that it's going to go up in value faster than the S&P or whatever else they could, they could uh, do with their money. So they go to homeowner meetings, they go to community meetings, they're involved in civic uh, uh, politics, they're thinking about who their representative is at council, they're involved. So home ownership leads to more involvement. But it's a two-way street. We talked about how do we get them to our table? Don't like those words. How do we get our table out to the neighborhoods? How do we move the table? The table doesn't have to be across town, the table can be out there, right? Um, I, I learned the hard way. You, you mentioned ethnography and focus groups. I, I, I learned the hard way. You can, you can offer all the incentives in the world for somebody to come to you to do a focus group. There are too many reasons why you don't want to do that, right? But if I go to you during a meeting you already have at your church, at your social group, at your PTSA, at the school, if I take that table to you, it's more convenient for you. That's all right. My job is as, as a paid person doing this is to, is to go to you, not have you come to me. So you can take those listening sessions, those community input sessions, to the rental apartments and listen to the folks there. You can, you can take it to the public library that's in the neighborhood, take it to the elementary school that's, that's out there, and, and do the work of the city in those neighborhoods getting people, more people to the table. Renters should have a voice in this too. Now, home ownership's not gonna be the solution. I'm, I'm in the midst of trying to sell a farm in, in the rural part of Guilford County and I'm, I'm learning nobody likes owning small farms. Um, it's, I, it's beautifully fixed up, I've got really nice land, you can put your horses out there and everything, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on this thing to, to sell so that I can move to another property. Sometimes home ownership is not so great. I just spent $6,500 on painting the house and $3,000 on the water softening system and gutters, oh my God, gutters are expensive. Um, I know from our research on health that gutters are important. Sometimes owning a house is not the thing, but that doesn't mean that the renter needs to be voiceless that means, you know, we, we need to think about more inclusive strategies to presenting uh, opportunities for voice, ownership of a neighborhood, even if you're not an owner of the neighborhood. So, so tenants unions or coalitions, union in the South is a bad word, 
Um, we need to think about ways of getting more input collectively on any of these policy decisions. Hope that answers some of your questions. Yes, ma'am. My question is that in some of these blighted neighborhoods that we have, we have a lot of renters because they can't afford to, as you say, become homeowners or their credit needs repair. But in the midst of those issues, we're still talking about valuable people. What I'm seeing is that if they are renters, they have a landlord. The landlords, if we bring the table to the community, the landlords aren't there. It's the renters. And most of the time, when they come to the table, the renters, they're so frustrated and confused about why the communication is not channeling. The communication starts between the landlord and the renter. The community, we come in to try to help the people. There's a missing piece of the puzzle. When we try to gentrify these neighborhoods that should be kept as valuable as the next neighborhood is, we don't get the same type of opportunities to keep the historic value of these communities for the people. Most of the time, the renters don't even realize how valuable the community is that they're living in because the communication is not there. They're trying to live somewhere that is affordable. Landlords are taking on properties that they want to make investments in. That's their first priority. The renter's priority is, I need to have a place to live for my family. So what I'm asking is, how can we, when, we, when the community does bring the information to the table, to the communities, how can we um, remain positive with the people? That's our first, that, that's our main objective, is to help our people. So what can we do as community um, vessels to keep the communication positive to support them between the landlord and the renter. Because if you're a renter, you should be treated the same as a homeowner. Your money is still valuable. Um, what can we do to keep the communication from the landlord to the renter, to keep them happy, to keep them feeling like they, they are somebody? In spite of a blighted community, you're still a person. You're still valuable. And that's the way we have to treat them. So you, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Even when we, take it to the ta when we take the table to them, they're so frustrated. They're so, they want more from us, but we're getting nothing from the other side. So, so I heard a couple of key elements there. And, and you repeated, I think, the word communication five, six times. Communication really is a big element of this. And facilitating, promoting, um, uh, teaching how to communicate. Uh, landlords, landlords are not ubiquitous. There's not one kind of land, there's not, they're all bad, they're all, yeah. Um, there's so many different types of landlords. We have Triad Apartment Association here. Um, I've met uh, quite a few really caring landlords um, I, I heard about one program in High Point, um, the Goldenrod Sheet. Um, four times a year, a renter can come to the, to the property manager and ask for a 30-day extension because they just don't have it today. They can't make their rent today. But up to four times a year, you can sign this piece of golden paper with me. It's not really a contract. It's just kind of a note that says, in 30 days, I will have your money one way or another. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my my fiduciary responsibility, my payment of my rent, and you're gonna give me a little break because you understand how hard it is. That's, that's a landlord who's listening, who's communicating, and actually who has face-to-face -face contact with their renters. We need more of that. We need, we need much more of that communication. So we need to encourage that. There's ways to encourage that. There's policies, I'm gonna throw one out there that some people love and some people hate, but um, some states, and previously in this state, there was residential occupancy certificates. 
you had to get a certificate to be a landlord, kind of like a license, and then your property had to be inspected and said that it's habitable, okay? If you're getting Section 8 funds, it has to pass an inspection before the government's gonna say, we're gonna give you some money. Well, we need that kind of inspection for every renter, right? If you're uh, buying a house, you're gonna get a home inspection before they're gonna write you a mortgage on it, but nobody right now is saying we're gonna inspect the property for the tenant if they're a renter, so nobody's on that side. I think that's one policy where we could, we could then intervene and say, okay, and as part of becoming a landlord, here are the responsibilities of communication to your tenant, but it's a two-way street. We've gotta get more tenant education out there as well. We need to have tenant education at the apartment complexes, at the public housing, as you sign up for Section 8, here's your responsibilities as a tenant, and sometimes that responsibility is speaking up, telling us if something's broken before it's too broken, right? Uh, uh, having some input on if there's a problem in your community. I think communication really is kind of underlying all of that. We don't communicate well in this society. For as many communication devices as we have and as much as we talk about talking, we don't talk to each other very well. Um, so we need more of that. I think Alan's got one over here. Yep, are we coming? Yeah. stores, places like that, and I offer myself and our staff and different folks, and we've worked with UNCG like a lot, um, and just being available to the public um, to answer. We will sit there for two hours at a time, and you wouldn't believe the questions. You know, it's an amazing thing. I've had a lot of fair housing cases come out of those subtle conversations along a grocery store line. Alan, can you repeat who you are and where you're from? Oh, sorry. Who am I? Uh, <laughs> Alan Hunt, City of Greensboro. Uh, fair housing guy for the city of Greensboro, partnership with HUD and partnership with UNCG. Uh, we also have a landlord tenant dispute program, which we partnership uh, with the Peace and Conflict Studies program with uh, Dr. Winker and some other folks. And of course, Dr. Sills has been a long time partner for us and he's a guiding light. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's a question there. So I've heard a lot of discussion in, in various media outlets recently that you know we are headed towards another housing market crash. You know, and housing markets, in terms of value, are fairly cyclical. You know, they're like the tides that happen you know once every ten years or so. And um, you know, while the, the the forthcoming one may not be as severe as 2008, um, you know, there are new emerging financial instruments, credit uh, trends you know, affecting um, low-income populations, things of that nature. Is there anything in your opinion that gives you optimism that communities are better prepared now uh, to encounter another uh, severe market slowdown or crash as compared to where we were in 2008? Thank you. Um, better prepared in the sense that so many of the people that had subprime loans so many of the people that were caught up in the financial speculation around purchasing uh, housing were foreclosed upon and no longer homeowners. That might actually be a protective factor if we move back into another housing collapse because they're not owning properties that are collapsing in value. And that sounds strange. It might be better to be a renter for a little while if there's a speculative market and the fact that we've already gotten rid of most of those really precarious loans, you know, the $300,000 loan on the $50,000 to $60,000 a year salary was not tenable. Um, you know, no paper loan and, and now you've got, you know, 14% interest just like a credit card um, and ballooning loans. and what, There's so much of that that's been lost. Um, for the property owners, and especially for those in the baby boomer generation, 10,000 a day, that are moving into retirement, uh, that are on a fixed income, a pension that will lose value, um, if not fixed um, in some way, uh, that's the segment of the population, home owning, 
uh, over 65 fixed income. Uh, just on the way in, Marketplace, NPR this morning, was talking about the growing share of elderly who have cost burdened, um, they're, they're spending 40, 50% of their, their limited income on housing. Uh, they're renting now, uh, many of them. Um, the ones that are homeowning aren't able to do the upkeep that's necessary. Uh, $10,000, $20,000 for a roof, $10,000 for a new HVAC system. Those costs that are uh, things you don't think to save for, you might be able to make the mortgage payment, you might pay the utilities, but then y y your, your heat goes out. And what do you do? when you're that, uh, that case. I think that's the precarious uh, uh, part of the population. Yep. Good evening. I wanted to know what are the forms of communication to better communicate with the gentrification makers? And also, what can be done to get more power into the hands of the people in these areas that are being anticipated? And what can I do to help protect the areas that I want to be protected from this How do I protect those? Okay. So we had a one, two, three in reverse order. How do we protect areas we want to protect? Well, we need to look at the data. Jesse's provided some data on what neighborhoods of color are changing in value and changing in race ethnic balance. Those are the neighborhoods that are gentrifying. So we can use that data to target specific areas to do outreach. Um, second, what, what is the communication? How do we speak to power? Um, CEOs, uh, nonprofit executives, uh, folks in government, get to go to things like Center for Creative Leadership trainings on how to be better speakers, how to talk to people, how to organize, how to convince and motivate. We need those kinds of trainings out in the community for lay leaders. We need those kinds of skills at the grassroots le level so that people can become leaders within their apartment complex, within their block group, within their PTSA, within their choice, uh, church or uh, social group. Uh, within their club. So, so we need better communication and leadership, leadership skills being taught to folks out in the neighborhoods, out in the communities. And I lost your third question. Can you repeat it real quick? How to communicate better? Where? How do we get more power? And, and that's really an issue of collective, uh, collective bargaining, collective uh, uh, organizing, getting people together. You can't balance out uh, the very wealthy person with a lawyer um, with yourself, usually. Uh, you need five or six people, 10 people, 20 people. You need all the tenants of your complex. You need your neighborhood association to be able to kind of balance that out. Have you ever seen that seesaw with the people on one side and a very powerful? Yeah, that's what you need. You need to get people together and motivated. Sometimes motivating people is, is, is the fear. Sometimes motivating people is the hope. I like the hope a lot better. What could we do here if we're together rather than what are we scared of? The scared reaction usually comes out kind of sideways. The, we want a better place really can be much more motivating. Finding out what that vision is shared, getting people together to share that vision, and then uh, finding platforms to, to promote that vision, I think are very possible. Um, listening earlier this week to a, a, a talk from some Bay Area organizers, they came up with a really great name, um, BARF. People wanted to know, what, what's this BARF on the agenda tonight? You know, BARF, Bay Area Resident Federation. The Bay Area Resident Federation was on everybody's city council agenda, and then every county commissioner's meeting, and, then every, and it was a group of residents, tenants, uh, who got together and said, we need more affordable housing in the San Francisco Bay Area, the most expensive housing market in, in the country. We need more building. We need people to start building more places so we'll have a place to live that we can afford. You need something like that. You need a Winston-Salem BARF group. Um, get, get the folks together, catchy acronym, a neat vision, 
a goal, collective action, and then um, uh, the leadership skills and training out into the community that can really begin to organize. Thank you.